music. This is a BBC Radio 6 Music documentary, The Thin Lizzy Story. Hello, I'm Midjur, and this is The Thin Lizzy Story. I can't tell you, you know, in terms of the history of rock and roll music or whatever, where Thin Lizzy fit in. I can tell you where they fit in in my life, which was just the combination of machismo and lyricism. Because when we were kids, it was the girl, you know, that was, was leading up to punk rock. Because when you're 15 and 16, you just want to, you know, crash the car. You know, you just want to hear the, those power chords and, and all of that. And so you had a lot of these uh, metallic groups that had that power, but none of the lyricism. And Thin Lizzy had both. I could tell you the story of a vagabond. Rather than just the Thin Lizzy story, it might be more accurate to say these are the Thin Lizzy stories. Stories from contemporaries like Bono and some members of the band and Phil and its mother, Philomena. From the moment Philip was born, I was just treated as vermin. And I was taken then and put in a workhouse. It was just dreadful. I was just beaten up and called the mother of the nigger and... I used to look at his little face and think, how can anybody call your names? I brought you into the world. I eventually begged my mother in Ireland to raise him, and my mother did, but she had to tell all the neighbours lies. She wouldn't tell them that Philomena had had a black baby. She said she was minding the baby for uh, some black people in England. And I used to come home, and the neighbours used to say to me, that's a lovely little fella there. He um, he reminds me of you when you were a little young one running around. And one neighbour annoyed me so much one day I said to her, Well, he is mine. <laughs> I did. The core of Thin Lizzy was always Philip Lynott and drummer Brian Downey, who grew up together in Dublin. In the 1960s, Ireland was a place for show bands, seven, eight or nine piece groups doing cover and country and western. But Philip and Brian were influenced by Jimi Hendrix, the Yardbirds and the Cream and they were serious about building a career. I met Philip for the first time sometime before the band moved to, to London, and this was before their deal with Decca Records, obviously. Jackie Hayden, who wrote My Boy with Philomena Lina. I remember him coming into my office and taking me down to a small studio called Trend Studios to play me some demos. And uh, I thought he was trying to get us interested as a record label here, but what he really seemed to want at the time was information from me about how Polydor Records in London operated and he pumped me for information over a period of time about what kind of deals they did, what kind of royalties they paid and he broached the subject of whether they would pay for him and the band to live in London and give them some pocket money for six months all of which I have to admit was totally new to me, I'd never heard of anything so bizarre in, in my life, the idea that record companies would give bands money for pocket money or for rent uh, I'd never heard of this and and um, it intrigued me at, to think later that Philip knew more about how record companies worked than I did. So I, I reckon Philip must have been exploring the business and learning about it and checking it out. I think that in itself is indicative of the kind of business sense he had as well. It was very, very tough. There was no such thing as putting out your own records, really. EMI did put out a single by Tin Lizzy, but that was very, very, very occasional. Well, I think that in many ways, uh, Ireland was a backwater. Niall Stokes, the editor of the Irish music magazine, Hot Press. I was thinking recently about uh, WBH's line, uh, where he said, you know, this, this is no country for old men. And that was back at the, the, in the early parts of the century. But in fact, 
Dublin in the 50s and into the early 60s really was a country for old men. <laughs> in fact, people became old very young in Ireland. And of course, that was to do with the fact that we, we, we were really on, on the periphery of Europe, uh, that there had been a policy of economic detachment. Um, and it was only with the, with the 60s and with, with the uh, change in, the, in that economic policy and the uh, arrival of television here that Irish society began to change. I think the, the global pop revolution or rock and roll rev revolution uh, really started to uh, take hold here during the 60s and people were opened up in terms of, of ideas. So in terms of people's attitude to sex and sexuality, things started to open up and uh, Oliver J. Flanagan who was a, uh, a politician, a famous politician here, famously said that um, sex didn't in exist in Ireland uh, until uh, television arrived and of course he was right because people's attitudes were tremendously narrow and repressed and the Catholic Church dominated to an extraordinary degree and there was a very strong culture censorship so all of those things had, had ensured that Ireland really was running somewhere like 10 to 20 years off the pace in European terms or international terms. It was a very strange time around this point. It seemed like it sort of happened overnight, like one minute everything was okay. I was with a show band who were very straight people. And it was around this time I wanted to form the group. Eric Bale. Things started happening in Dublin, like everyone that I knew was... Uh, in the group scene was smoking dope and dropping acid and living together and sitting in the park all day. It was the end of 1969. Philip Lynott and Brian Downey were playing in Orphanage. Belfast guitarist Eric Bell had been told about them by Eric Rickson, who would be Lizzie's first keyboard player. Bell went to see them play. The thing that hit me was Philip's stage presence and Brian Downey's drumming. And I got this idea in my head, I wanted Brian Downey in my band. Orphanage took a break, and for some reason, it was only Philip and Bran that came into the changing room. And I started uh, talking to them. I said, I used to be with the Dreams show band. And uh, Philip said, oh yeah, Gary Moore talks about you a bit, you know? Because Gary was a friend of mine as well. I asked them, did they know any musicians that they could put me in touch with? And they said, come down to this bar on Friday nights. There's loads of musicians there, and we'll introduce you. So I was just about to walk out and Philip called me back and he said to Brian Downey, listen, Orphanage just went as far as we can go. Do you fancy forming a group with Eric? Brian said, yeah, I don't care. Whatever you want to do. Within 18 months, the first album, Thin Lizzy, was released. It got some airplay on Radio Luxembourg. David Jensen also supported the second album, Tales of a Blue Orphanage, released in March 1972, but neither sold well. If we weren't playing, we used to rehearse once a week in this pub and um, one day, we were sitting there and there was no ideas at all. So Phil picked up uh, a six-string guitar. You know, he started singing Seven Drunken Nights and all these type of Irish folk things, just as a laugh. And then he started doing Whiskey in a Jar. At one point, I was, I was so bored, I started playing along with him. I didn't make up... But I got a little bit of an idea, and then Bran started playing it. So at that point, Ted Carroll, who was our one of our managers then came into the room and he said, what was that song you were playing? And Phil said, no, I'm only messing about Ted, you know, was whiskey in the jar. And Ted said, um, I think you have a hit there. Good job. 
let you love me Never would you leave me For the devil take that woman For you know she treat me easy But she ring dumb do dumb a da Wait for my daddy oh Wait for my daddy oh There's whiskey in the jar Around this time, Thin Lizzy was seen by Chris Morrison and Chris O'Donnell, the management team who would guide them through the rest of their career. How I got involved with Thin Lizzy's management, Ted Carroll and Brian Chute had been managing the band previous to, it, to, previous to this, and um, Brian Chute, for financial reasons, was pulling out, and Ted was looking for a new partner. I was the band's agent, and Ted suggested to him, he came into the office and said he wanted me to get some dates because he wanted to bring Billy Gaff, who was then Rod Stewart's manager, down to have a look at the band. So... Um, I said, well, I wasn't terribly happy about that. We went downstairs to have a pub underneath my office to have a drink. And I said, well, look, if you want, looking for a partner, I'd like to get involved. Uh, he sort of said, oh, yeah, fine, OK. And as we walked out of the pub, my having paid for the drinks, he said, and that'll be £40 for the wages. I'd saved £1,000. And uh, by the time Whiskey in the Jar was a hit, which was five, six months later, I'd put the full £1,000 and invested it into the band. 1973, Vagabonds of the Western World was released, and on New Year's Eve that year, Eric Bell made a dramatic exit. I sort of freaked out, you know, um, too much of this and too much of that, and not enough of good food and rest and so on. And I just had a sort of a, a very, very horrendous breakdown. And it was in uh, Queen's University in Belfast, ironically. And I threw my guitar up in the air and kicked all my amplifiers off and that was the, the last night I ever played with them. I was halfway through a tour, they got Gary Moore to, to fill in for the rest of the tour and I went my way and they went theirs.
Eric was gone and the lineup was fluid. Even Brian Downey left for a few weeks. Chris O'Donnell outlines the priorities. The talent essentially was Philip and Brian. They always were going to be a band. Even though Eric had left, it was, it was important that we kept that, that team together. It was in the days when, when huge record company advances just didn't exist, so you had to be a working band and you had to live by your income. So it was paramount to me to make sure that they could perform live so that Phil could develop as a songwriter and they could develop as a group. Phil really wanted to keep it a three-piece, I think. He didn't really want to call it Thin Lizzy anymore and he, he wanted a new band, so it was just basically the, the idea of having a completely new sound and a new band, but obviously the management wanted to keep the same name. Uh, but changing the direction of the band and that's why there was two of us in there, really. Brian Robertson was already familiar with Lizzie's material when he joined the band. Scott Gorham had come to England hoping for a place in Supertramp. When he failed to get into the band, he began to play the London pub circuit. And one of the people that uh, would come up and jam with us was a guy named Rowan O'Loughlin. And he knew Phil and Brian and he knew that they were looking for another guitar player. And he came to the pub one evening and asked me if he wanted me to if, if, he, if he wanted me to put my name forward to for an audition for this band called Thin Lizzy and I'd never heard of this thing called Thin Lizzy in actual fact I thought it was probably the silliest name I'd ever heard of in my life but uh, he said you know they're, they've had a, a, a minor hit with uh, a song called Whiskey in a Jar and I'd never heard of that and he says, but, you know, I think they're paying 30 quid a week. And I went, whoa, man, put my name in. <laughs> we had no money at this point. We were absolutely, in fact, less than no money. Chris Morrison. Yeah, I actually was supporting the group at this point for about £25,000. And Phonogram and former Vertigo were extremely interested in signing the band. It was decided that they wanted to see the band live, as with the new lineup. And we had a date coming up at the Marquee Club. And... Uh, we suddenly realised that it was the first date the band were actually going to play and everybody was coming down from the record company and we booked them into um, four shows around Wales and Wolverhampton. We did four shows prior to the marquee so they could actually play in front of an audience. I'd never rehearsed like that before in my life. We would be in rehearsals six days a week, uh, probably up to sometimes 10, 12 hours a day because we knew that... Uh, if we hadn't uh, secured ourselves a deal, uh, by the time we'd finished the marquee, Thin Lizzy would be no more. So, but, you know, fortunately, we, we did the first three shows. They went okay, and we got to the marquee, and uh, I think we punched a few lights out when we got to uh, the marquee in London. And on the uh, Tuesday, they played at the marquee, and it was a hot, hot night, and it was stuffed to the gills with people. But they went on stage, started playing. Luckily, the phonogram people weren't there, and every guitar went out of tune. So the first couple of songs sounded really ropey. And I remember I was completely nerve-wracked. And finally, the band came off sto stage, and I happened to be in the dressing room, and I just thought, well, hey, great, terrific. I'm just going out to there outside now to see what the phonogram people think. And they walked through the door, and I thought, I've got to apologise them, to them for the way the guitars sounded. And as I walked through the door, I went, hi, I know... And Nigel Grain said, yeah, wasn't it great? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I know it was fantastic. <laughs> we, we got the deal, so the day was saved. <laughs> the Thin Lizzy lineup was set. Two guitars complementing each other rather than the traditional lead and rhythm. A strong stage presence and fill in its unique lyricism, which often reflected his Irish roots. Niall Stokes. He maintained that feel for Irish melodies right throughout his career and and the the i mean there's a lot of minor uh keys and melodies which have a very strong folk influence in in lizzie's music so that's that's there throughout but there was also an interest in in ireland and in, and in irish mythology and uh again uh, he, he he continued that interest throughout his career jackie hayden he still had, a, I think, um, a desire to write songs that were about something. 
Um, they just weren't kind of uh, endless cliches taken from the, the rock and roll sort of five-step program of how to write songs. Uh, I think he had he really had something to say. And uh, the, the fact that he actually wrote songs about his own kids, for example, I mean, I'm not aware of too many other rock stars who've done that without making it really something that you'd cringe at. But Philip could actually do it and, and make and ju- the songs would justify themselves. It'd be kind of quality songs. Philomena Lynott. Every song he ever wrote had a meaning or a story attached to it that meant something to him. I always felt that Little Girl in Bloom was the story of myself uh, when I was frightened to tell my father the, the words Little Girl in Bloom, she carries a secret, a child she carries in her womb. I could never tell my parents. Then he wrote uh, Sarah. The first Sarah was for my mother and the second Sarah was for his daughter. When you came in my life, you changed my world, my Sarah. Everything seemed so right, my baby girl, my Sarah. You are all I need to live my love to you, I'll give. You are all I want to know, oh, my Sarah. Don't let go, oh, oh, my Sarah. But it wasn't just the songs. The twin guitars of Scott Gorham and Brian Robertson would set a style for Lizzie that would remain unique. Later Scott would play with Gary Moore, Snowy White, John Sykes and me. But how did Scott and Brian view each other? Obviously he's grown up with a lot of the American influences which uh, I didn't have other than the blues side of it and what you would see on top of the pops or whatever. Um, he listened to a lot of sort of surfing stuff, I guess, and things like that. He was a lot better on rhythm than I was. I was, I was pretty pretty terrible on rhythm, to be honest. I tend to hit block rock chords, and he'd play full sort of uh, right hand uh, sort of stuff, um, which kind of complemented each other a bit, you know. I, I was a bit lazy, really, because uh, what he was doing was probably a wee bit more. Uh, difficult than what I, what I was doing, but I'm a very lazy player anyway, I always have been. Most people, it would be the lead guitar player and the rhythm guitar player, and the rhythm guitar player, that's all he did, was play the uh, supporting role. Where, uh, I think, with uh, Phil, he wanted two personalities up front, uh, up front of the stage with him. Brian was very much uh, the blues guitar player with was uh, with rock leanings, right? Which uh, became, after a while, a little bit more towards the rock thing, but still very much in the blues style. So he played, you know, the fifths and thirds, the you know, the uh, the more chunky things, and I tended to uh, uh, use, you know, the full six strings uh, kind of thing to, to to make up the you know that sound. Between nightlife and fighting, the band had the first U.S. tour. Up to that point, we had done sort of okay-ish in in uh, Britain and in Europe, but you know the first two albums that we had done were just uh, abysmal failures. I mean, they did not sell a bean, right? And we got so now now it's time to do uh, Jailbreak, the Jailbreak album, but this this one was uh, a little bit different. In the way we approached it, we actually got out of London, rented uh, a farm, and with a uh, we brought our own sort of eight track down. Uh, we went into heavy, heavy rehearsals, uh, demoing every everything, uh, and through that album came uh, you know the boys are back in town, right? 
But we put it out in, in England, and it, it sort of, once again, didn't really do anything. But now it was out in America, and it really started to be, become a hit through the Midwest now. Not any of the West Coast, but in the Midwest. Out of this tiny little station, it kept get playing over and over and over again, and through that, another station picked it up, and another one, and another one, to the point where, you know, there was a, a call to the office saying, hey, you know, I think you got a hit song here. And the boys are back, took off, and we were getting feedback from, from the management in Britain. Then we started putting together the, uh, the sort of homecoming gig, uh, which is all on the back of the boys are back, really. And from there, it just it seemed to it really started to snowball. But now it's not back to the marquee. But now we're now it's back to playing the Hammersmith Odeon. Thin Lizzy on top of the pops was like Ireland being in the World Cup. Bono from U2. And so they became the centre of the universe for people who were writing or writing about rock and roll or writing in rock and roll. I, I know Adam uh, thought that uh, Phil in it would be his way to win the world uh, because Adam was managing U2 at the time and he rang Phil at about I guess it was about eight in the morning after their gig in Daly Mount Park and uh, he hadn't quite figured out yet that rock and roll people don't get up at eight o'clock but that was, you know, that, that, that was it. They were over the wall and for anyone else on the other side you, you're going to ask them how they did it. While they may have been massive in the UK and doing very well in Europe they still hadn't cracked it in the US. The tour to support Jailbreak had ended early when Phil took ill. The next tour a few months later was with a hastily reorganised lineup. Gary Moore stepped in again. The night before the tour, Rob had gone out for something to eat. I'd already packed my bags ready to go the next morning. Uh, I went uh, to the Speakeasy Club to get something to eat, basically. Uh, as it happened, there was some friends of mine playing down there, Frankie Miller and... Somebody went for him with a bottle and I put my hand in the way, as I would do for anybody. Uh, I got my hand cut and there was a fight went on. But at the end of the day, that could have happened any time. I was gutted about the thing, you know, but I, I certainly, I, I would not change that. I wouldn't turn around and say, right, I'm not going to stick my hand in front of that guy's face again. Now, Frankie was a friend of mine and I'm... No way would I have not done today what I did yesterday. I'm sorry, I, I, I certainly wouldn't change that. We were great around the edges of America. If you could see water, we were big. <laughs> right? As soon as you lost sight of the ocean, we, we were not big at all. West coast, east coast, southern coast, they were, they were into more of the sort of the rougher sound and bands. I mean, we were, we were kind of the street punk kids of our time, right? Where, and, and the middle part of America didn't really want to know about that at, at that point. I think that Lizzie's success in America was curtailed by a couple of dramatic incidents. Niall Stokes, the editor of the Irish music magazine Hot Press. I think it's one of the great 
tragedies of Irish rock history that Lizzie just didn't get through uh, to make that final take that final step up up uh, to the major league. Having said that, someone like Bob Geloff was watching that, and he was honing his own ambitions against a knowledge of what Philip Linnet and Tim Lizzie had achieved. Gary Moore was to become a permanent member of the band, but in reality, he stayed only a short time, with Robo joining again during the recording of Bad Reputation. When I passed you in the doorway, well, you took me with a glance. I should have took that last bus home, but I asked you for a dance. Now we go steady to the pictures. I always get chocolate stains on my pants. And my father, he's going crazy. He says I'm living in a trance, but I'm dancing in the moonlight. Caught me in its spotlight It's alright Dancing in the moonlight On this long hot summer night And I'm walking home The last bus is long the definitive Lizzie album was to follow, inspired by the album Frampton Comes Alive. We were on tour in America, and the Frampton album was absolutely mega ginormous. Right? And it was really getting up Phil's nose. And I, and I always remember this day. We were in the car, but I don't know if we were going to a gig or coming back, whatever, and, and Frampton's album came on. And Phil turned around to me and says, we could do that. And the next thing I knew, was uh, we were all talking now about doing our own live album. This is something that we could really do and really do well, right? And that's what we did. Live and Dangerous was amazing. It was the, the blueprint for a live record that would have a beginning, middle and end. And that's uh, the way you two still approach playing a show, is that we want the, the whole to be more than the sum of the parts. And it was just this concoction of romance and aggression that that just took you away. Down from the glen came the marching men with their shields and their swords to fight the fight they believed to be right. Overthrow the overlords to the town where there was plenty. I mean, I loved the whole Brian Robertson period because it was all so brand new, uh, and we were we were kind of you know cutting our way through through a new style of, of, of music, never trying to copy anybody. That's what I loved about being in Thin Lizzy is we never ever 
tried to uh, copy anybody's style. We never tried to go with what was trendy for that month or year or whatever. For some reason, we were very close. I'm still wearing Phil's earring that his mother gave me, you know. I swore never to take that out. She'll kill me if I take it, or I'll lose it or something. I'll be dead, you know. Um, but the families are all very close, and I think that and we were all pretty volatile in our own in our own ways. More me and Phil, really. I mean, Scott tended to be fairly laid back until he sort of blew his stack eventually, you know. And Downey would just sit on the fence and say, oh, for goodness sake, now, come on. You know, he was, he was a bit of a laid back guy, you know, and he didn't really get involved in Barney's unless he really, really had to. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that entirely. He was a very, very pleasant man, you know. I think that it was very difficult to keep such a volatile bunch of people as were involved in Lizzie uh, together. And of course, uh, they, they did live the rock and roll lifestyle and some people managed that and came through and ultimately, you know, Philip indulged not, not wisely but too well. Um, so somewhere in that area, there were the seeds of, of the ultimate destruction of, of the band. Gildor. I think when it started to go off the boil, and that was when they tried breaking America, and you know they just the Americans couldn't get it that here was a black guy who was in a rock band, and that's ever been the case. There's rarely been a successful black rock band. The Boys Are Back in Town was a big hit, but it wasn't a number one. But the the album didn't sell on the back of it, and their tours weren't great on the back of it. Now that's again not an unusual phenomena. Uh, Roxy Music, Dexy's Midnight Runners, David Bowie for ages couldn't get arrested, even though he had hit records. And I think that really disillusioned him. And then the punks came along, so suddenly it wasn't that cool to be this sort of band. So he, his natural. Compass was in disarray about where he and what he should have done was stay exactly where he was, keep writing the fantastic songs, and it would have gone into a very deep, deep slough, and then it would have come back because, as it has, they would have been a massively wealthy, huge band had they hung around, had Philip not lost the the plot personally. Brian Robertson played his last gig with Lizzie in July 1978, a month after Live and Dangerous was released, and once again. Gary Moore was to replace him, and once again, it was only for a short time, but long enough to record Black Rose. Gary didn't manage to complete another US tour, and at short notice. So we got a phone call from the office saying, uh, Phil's been on the phone, because I'd met Phil many times before, and, uh, and he said, uh, uh, Gary's not in the band anymore. Um, they're in the middle of America, halfway through a tour with Journey. Could I jump on Concord and, and fly out and, and finish the tour for them? I was on Concord with a, with a, a great big ghetto blast of a pair of headphones. It was before Walkmans, and uh, and trying to learn all the parts. Went on stage the next night. Uh, it was fantastic, uh, wonderful, vibey thing to do. The explosions and playing all your favourite songs and things. I, I, I was never going to be an official member because uh, my, my heart was in Ultravox. Because uh, we used to I used to play tapes to the, the guys, uh, much to their dismay, when we were travelling around in the, the back of the limo. I'd say, yeah, listen to this, this is magazine, or listen to this, this is craft work. And Scott would be sitting there going, oh God, no, not again. He wanted to hear ZZ Top and stuff. So uh, in a way, that kind of influence rubbed off a bit, especially when Phil came to do his, his, uh, his solo recordings. When we had done all that, Phil was into his solo performance thing, and we ended up writing a couple of things together, just things that we had jammed, like the 
what became the theme tune for Top of the Pops, Yellow Pearl. So we were in the studio, uh, he was jamming on an idea, um, and it, it turned into uh, do anything you want to do. Um, and I, I had no idea that I'd written any of this, I just thought he, he can have led the way, but he was incredibly gracious and gave me part of the songwriting for it. Um, I didn't really write anything of that. I, I, not that I remember or recall at all. He, he, he gave it to me. I'd never written anything before in my life. And he said, there you go. And the, the record came out, had my name on it. When I was researching the uh, authorised biography of Thin Lizzy, The Ballad of the Thin Man, uh, I spoke to many of the members of the band and uh, the general impression I got was that the later albums, uh, the band was really going into decline. Stuart Bailey. Black Rose was Thin Lizzy's last sort of great stand and I think Gary Moore added a lot to it and, and, and Phil tried to get his whole Irish mythology on that record and kind of half succeeded in it and it was quite a good record. And then they went into this kind of um, the, the wilderness years, really. Um, Chinatown, Renegade, um, Thunder and Lightning, um, part of which Phil threw himself into this kind of new wave of British heavy metal, which I thought limited him an awful lot. It became very macho and almost boorish. Uh, they had Snowy White playing guitar, who, who was a nice gentleman, but didn't really fit in at all, so it was, it was a bit loose that way. And occasionally there was, it was a nice song, you know, that, where he would sort of show that the, the fragility of his life, where he, where he was literally falling apart. So, you know, the songs like Renegade. And uh, on, on Thunder and Lightning, uh, that they got John Sykes in, a new guitarist, and he added a wee bit of Vim. I think by the end, Phil had become a, a kind, of, kind of a cult artist. He'd lost that broad appeal. And he, he kind of was trying to be trendy, trying to get into the studs and all that kind of thing. You know, and at the same time, Phil was trying to do his second solo album and work on all their stuff. And, and it was just, there was, there was no time for it to do anything properly. It was just a, a kind of a hodgepodge towards the end. And in fact, he should have just bided his time and become legendary. And that, that's, that, that's what he should have done, really. It was never a musical thing. It was more of a physical thing. Both Phil and I uh, were really having problems with drugs at this point. Both of us had heroin addictions. Everything suffers, you know, your 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 lifestyle, your your, your playing, your health. Uh, mentally, you're gone, uh, and f physically, you, you're just you're knackered. You can't do it any longer. And I just felt that my guitar playing had gotten so bad at this point, and my my head had gotten so bad that there there really is no point in carrying this this thing on and. And the one thing that really scared me is I had been in this band for so long and fought and worked so hard in this band to watch the the name being dragged down because of, of things that both Phil and I had, had inflicted on ourselves. I just could not take the thought of that. And I explained that to Phil and um, uh, he didn't like the decision. <laughs> he He thought we could we could keep going and we could work our work ourselves out of this but but being Phil and the great salesman that he is <laughs> he says right well you know this, this is what we'll do we'll we'll do one last album and then we'll do one last tour and listen I know this great guitar player he's a really good kid his, his name is John Sykes he's with this group called Tigers of Pantang and and we'll do the one last album and tour and then we'll call it quits right and I'm glad, he, I'm glad he did, as a matter of fact. I'm glad he talked me into doing it because I think uh, the Thunder and Lightning album, it was a good one to, to go out on. I think John's a great player. Uh, so I really think it, it was a good way to go. She knows it all too well 
know, he had his personal road. He was like, for what? You know, you're not making the money, Phil, you know. You've got to scale expectation down. I'd have these talks with them, you know, serious Bob, you know. And I'd say, look, man, you can make an album here. You don't have to do that. You can just get rid of the whole thing and, you know, maybe do an album just playing by yourself because you know, he could play his ass off. And when you'd hear him singing a song just with the guitar, you'd go, Jesus, that's brilliant. You know, he never lost the talent, he just lost the compass. I was actually at the last gig, live gig they did because I was playing at the gig with Motorhead. I watched them play with John, John Sykes, and I thought they were playing real well. But by that time, Scott and Phil, I think, uh, were hurting. I think, basically, they should maybe have stopped maybe a year before, uh, straightened out and then looked at it again. Chris O'Donnell. I always think that drug taking in the music business is, uh, for artists, they're susceptible to it for a number of reasons. You're targeted. You know, people get into you, hey, there's cash there, there's money there, people can afford it, and, you know, and they're probably going to do this, so it's easy for them to do it. And um, we kept people away for as long as we possibly could. I mean, we, you know, you would suspect somebody and keep them away from them, but you can't protect them 100%. And not only that, people have their own, you know, they, they have the dignity of making their own decisions for life. They have to make their own decisions as to what they're going to do. Bono from U2. I used to meet Phil in and around, and he was, he was quite the rock star, and I was an apprentice rock star. As the years went by, he got a house on the north side in a place called Hoth, and, and I lived in about four doors up from in uh, a little three-room cottage, which was U2's rehearsal room. So I used to bump into him a lot there, and he used to say, you know, if you want, you know, we would have to meet up go for dinner, and and I I didn't quite know how to re to react to that. I didn't I didn't follow up on that ever. I was kind of in awe of him. I think is what it was, and I just didn't didn't want to didn't know what I'd say um, if I was sitting down in Philo's house. But there was another side of it too, which is, you know, he'd really gotten into the lifestyle. Uh, of self-destruction at that point and I guess you know we were a bit anti that I didn't like to see what he seemed to be doing to himself and when he died I must say I, I really resented the fact that I hadn't you know uh, dropped in to see him more often um, because maybe Maybe it was just, he was looking for some people that were outside of his scene. I don't know. Yeah, that's entirely possible. Uh, because the period when he actually did die, <clears throat> I used to, I mean, I always kept in close contact with Phil and I'd go down and see him. He was certainly surrounded by a lot of people I didn't like uh, and a lot of people that were not good for him. Things were so weird that, that around Phil's circle of so-called friends who of course weren't um, that those reaching out moments were, were very few and far between and if you had have sort of turned around to him and said look stop your bloody nonsense da 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 which you really feel you wanted to it would have to have been somebody like like Bono I guess to, to get through but again with hindsight you look back and you think well I could have said this, or I could have phoned so and so, and da da da. I don't think it would have. I think it'd gone too far, to be honest. It was very sad, but there you go. Three years after Lizzie played together for the last time, Philip was dead. On Christmas Day, 1985, Phil told his mother that Rody Big Charlie McLennan would be staying over for the holidays. Charlie arrived on the Christmas morning with his suitcase. He gave me a big hug, and I and he said, "Where is he?" I said, Charlie, he's not well. I've had the doctor. And he went, has nobody told you yet? And I went. And he ran up the stairs. And he came back down. He said, I've told him I've told you. He said, now we're getting an ambulance. Uh, the phone rang, and it was Caroline. And I was in hysterics. And I told her. And she said she'd arranged for him to be put into a clinic. 
and we got Philip down to the clinic and then he was taken to the infirmary where he spent the last 11 days of his life and it was awful but I didn't think I was going to lose him I really really didn't and um, I, then a priest came walking past me one day and I said where are you going he said I'm going in to see Philip I said oh no don't go in there with, the, with your collar showing I said um, I don't you know he'll think he's dying if you go in there he said he's asked for me I said what he said he's asked for me and my knees buckled and uh, so he made his peace with God as far as I know and um, I, but I still I mean no way was my Philip going to die no way but he did you see and uh, I died with him I am just a cowboy lonesome on the trail a starry night a campfire light The coyote call And the howling winds will So I'll ride out To the woods and down very much in the terms of uh, bands that I've listened to that have affected me over the years, musicians type musicians, like Little Feet and I think when you look at the number of bands that have come after Lizzie that cite Lizzie as influences Bon Jovi, Delamitri, you've got like Mordred doing Johnny the Fox and that's probably one of the stronger points of pride as far as the legacy is concerned. There was a field of music that I just didn't like, which was hard rock or rock. And um, this guy was making it very clever, lyrically, with something to say, melodically beautiful melodies, incredible harmonies on the guitar, marrying it all into fantastic, um, lasting pop music. That's an incredible um, artistic achievement, and I, I often think that they're not... Philip is never is not credited with that. He was always he's always credited being Jack the Lad, uh, a good songwriter, a great rock band. But actually, what they did, I think, was bring intelligence, musical and verbal intelligence, um, to hard rock music. It's okay, amigos. You can let yourself go. We'll be right here. You know, while we were out there doing it, I, I think the last thing on our minds was, you know, geez, are, are we influencing anybody? Because <laughs> I don't think you actually think in those kind of terms. You're too worried about 
you know, are we going to sell enough records to be able to keep the record company interested so we can make the next album, so we can go out on tour? And it was quite interesting how the, the name never lost its, uh, its appeal when I was fully expecting it to only last just a few years after we quit. Yeah, even if it was the stupidest name I'd ever heard. <laughs> Love for me.